Okay, so let us look at these uh, chemical uh, communication in plants. Uh, basically, we call them as a plant hormone, or more accurately, actually, they are plant growth regulator. So it means that they are involved in the growth of the plant. Okay, they are responsible for most of communication within the plant. If you look at this, uh, as I said that uh, in previous lesson, Compared to the animal hormones, the plant growth regulator, growth regulator, they are not produced in the specialized cells. Huh? They don't have a specialized glands that actually produce. They can be any parts, any variety of the tissues that will be able to produce these um, hormones. Okay, so they move, they move in the plant either directly from south to south by diffusion or active transport, or carry in the a fl a phloem sept or xylem sept. So it means that again, you can see that they don't have like a special uh, uh, a glands to produce them and transport them in the, like something like a blood vessel, but they transport most of the time from the south to the south. Okay, by diffusion across the plasma that's smarter or by active transport. Okay, so some may not move far from the site of the synthesis. Okay, and may have their own effects at the nearby cells only. Eh? They won't travel very long like humans. Your hypothalamus, for example, is the one that produce. Okay, for example, ADH store in the posterior pituitary glands. And then from posterior pituitary glands, they have to, eh, to travel a long way to reach your kidney. But in this case, they may affect the surrounding tissues or surrounding cells only. Okay, so the plant hormone interact with the receptor on the cell surface. Okay, or maybe inside the cytoplasm or even the nucleus. So this receptor usually initiates a serious chemical or ionic signal that's amplified and transmit the signal within the cells. So two types of plant growth regulator we are going to learn here. First one is auxin, involved in the cells elongation, highlight cells elongation. Okay, and also we're going to look at the gibberellin or we call GA, gibberellin acid, which involved in the seed germination and storm I stop the stem elongation, okay? The stem elongation. So we look at the oxid. So which part of the cells actually are, or, or tissue, are tissues that uh, produce oxid, they synthesize in the growing tips. So the cells that actively carry out the mitosis and division, uh, cell divisions, okay? So how they transport? So it transported back down the shoots or up the roots by active transport from cell to cells or to the lesser extent in the phloem set. Okay, uh, so what actually happened here is, now look at this. Uh, let me show you how the transportation first. Okay. So oxygen actually can be transported in two forms. Okay, depend on where they are. So they can be transported in the neutral form. Means that's no charge or in the oxid, which, which is ionized form. So when oxid in a neutral form, to become the oxid in the ionized form, so neutral, then they release hydrogen ions or protons. So it means that these ions, now oxygen ions, is a negatively charged. Are you clear? They are negatively charged. So what actually happened here is, now look at this. I'm going to draw out the cells. So one cells. And the second cells. Okay, so what actually happened here is, you can see that, okay. Now, overall transportations, uh, again, it's not a direct transportation. In this case, active transport. What you're going to see here is at the membrane here, they have this transporter. So when oxygen, when oxygen in, okay, oxygen inside the cytoplasm, they are negatively charged, oxygen negatively charged. Are you clear? Oxygen negatively charged. So when this oxygen have to cross, because negatively charged, they won't be able to diffuse across the phospholipids bilayer. Are you clear? This oxygen 
they cannot be fused across the phospholipid bilayer. So because they are negatively charged, they only can cross this special transporter. Okay. So when they reach the south, uh, south wall, what will happen here is this auxin and cell wall actually have the proton, then it becomes the auxin neutrophil. Are you clear? In the cell wall, in a neutral form. So neutral form, then therefore, this neutral form of auxin now can diffuse across the phospholipids bilayer and enter into the nearby cells. Are you clear? Okay, uh, so this oxide in the neutral form, A. So this neutral form then dissociate again into the negatively charged form with proton. Okay, and this negatively charged oxygen will going to cause the proton pump okay, to pump the H plus into this, okay, into the south wall. Are you clear? With the phosphorylations is the proton pump. Can you see that? So it means that it's something like a recycle. Can you see that? It's something like a recycle. It's slightly different. Now look at my pointer. Hey, where's my pointer? Okay, can you see that? H plus enter in the cell wall, like H plus carry the auxin back like this. Can you see that? So high concentration oxygen, okay, then slowly move down. Can you see that? So oxygen will diffuse down. And then when you reach the, can you see that diffuse down? When you reach the cell wall here, because it's negatively charged, can not? So when it's negatively charged, what will happen here is they can diffuse across this transporter. And this transporter only at one side, the lower part here, for example. So it means that the oxygen won't be transported backwards. So oxygen come in, oxygen diffuse and continue to be transported down from south to south. So it's class it classified by active transport because we pump the proton into the cell wall and then the proton seems like bring the oxygen back into the cells. Can you see that? So the transportation require ATP. So that's why we call it as the active transport. Okay. So what is the role of here? So oxygen, can you see that? What is the function of oxygen? Oxygen actually now cause the proton to be accumulated into the cell wall. So when a proton accumulated in the cell wall, what will happen here is the cell wall now become acidified. So become acidic. And this acidic condition is very important because acidic condition is an optimum pH or optimum pH for an enzyme called expensive where we're going to discuss it later. Are you clear? So this pH, for example, expansion only work at low pH. And because of the transportations here, can you see that the proton, because of the oxygen, oxygen that just stimulates the proton pump, allow the proton to be pumped into the cell wall. So basically makes the, the cell wall become acidic, allows the expansion. Expansion is an enzyme. So what is the function of enzyme? This enzyme going to weaken the cell wall so when we weaken the cell wall, then cell wall actually will, I mean, it becomes a weaker and then allow the water molecule to enter. Therefore, cell elongation take place. Okay. Huh? So due to the movement, huh? due to the movements of the oxygen, oxygen actually, can you see that? It stimulates the proton pump. Eh? Oxygen binds the receptor, stimulate the proton pump, allow the protons to be pumped from the cytoplasm into the cell wall. So this proton, the presence of the proton actually cause what? Cause the loosenings of the cellular microfiber. Can I see that? It makes the cell wall become weaker. So if the cell wall become weaker already, then they cannot exert or cannot withstand the turgor pressure, allowing the water molecule now to move in. Okay. So for example, we do know that if let's say originally, okay, in the cell, Okay, because we do know that water potential okay, equal to the solid potential plus the pressure potential. Cannot. If the solid potential equal to negative 2, pressure potential equal to positive 2, then water potential equal to 0. So there is no net movement of the water molecule in and out of the cell. So that's why the cell would burst because the cell wall exert the pressure potential. But now because of the cell wall, and means they become weaker, they won't be able to provide sufficient pressure potential. That's a positive one. So now you can see that the water potential inside the cell is negative one. 
Okay, outside the pure water post, uh, uh, pure water is zero. So this uh, means uh, create the water potential gradients allow the, oops, sorry. Okay, so allows this uh, water molecule to enter into the cells and cause the cells expansion to take place because outside zero kilopascal, inside positive uh, negative one kilopascal. So therefore, water molecule enter and exert the turgor pressure, the cell expand. Okay, uh? so you can try the questions here. I will discuss the question answer later, okay? Okay, uh, so molecule oxygen, okay, first they have to bind to receptor, okay, proteins on the cell surface membrane. So the binding of oxygen stimulate the ATPase proton pump. So what you call ATPase because they actually require ATP. So right down here, so during this process of a proton pump to pump, then definitely we need to have the ATP uh, to phosphorylate the proton pump. Okay, so it means that to move the protons across the cell surface membrane from the cytoplasm into the cell wall. Very important, huh? this one. So in the cell wall, there are proteins, or actually more precisely, it's known as the enzymes. Okay, right now, it's an enzyme okay, known as the expansin. Eh? Expansin, they are activated by decrease in pH. So it means that must be in acidic conditions. Only we will be able to actually cause it to be activated okay so this expansion loosen the linkage eh, between the cellulose microfiber so it's thought that expansion disrupt the non-covalent interactions between the cellulose microfiber so what means non-covalent because in the cellulose microfiber uh, they are linked by the hydrogen bonds so right now they actually break the hydrogen bonds between the cellulose microfiber and the surrounding substances for example hemicellulose is something not in the syllabus don't worry about that in the cell wall so these disruptions occur briefly, not, not very, 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 I mean, uh, vigorously, okay, until, I mean, the, the cell wall, the cell wall buzz, but actually very briefly only, see? So that the microfiber can move past each other, allowing the cell to expand without losing much of the overall strength of the wall. So just, we say that it's just weakened a bit, okay? A slightly weakens the cell wall, okay? So the binding oxygen on the receptor also activate the potassium ion channel. So the potassium ion channel are also stimulated to open, leading to the increase in the potassium ion concentration in the cytoplasm. Now, this is very important. When you have the potassium ion channel open already, allows the potassium ions to enter into the cytoplasm, definitely decrease the water potential. Therefore, water molecule enter into the cell through the aquaporins by osmosis. Aquaporin is, means water channel. Down the water potential gradients and the pressure potential causes the wall to stretch so that this wall become longer and also elongated. Okay. Uh? Any questions so far, guys? Any questions? So basically, uh, the expansions here Okay, it caused the, the entry because of the entry of the water molecule. So when the water molecule enter, it will cause the cell to elongate. So when the cell elongate, therefore, I mean, uh, you can see that when, when the oxygen move from one cell to another cell already, then the hydrogen atom, sorry, hydrogen ion or proton become less, okay, or less concentrated. Therefore, inactivates the expansion, allowed the re uh, 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 build of the cell wall. Okay. Uh. So now next and uh, hormones we're gonna look at it is the gibberellin. So gibberellin are plant growth regulator. They are synthesized in most part of the plant. They are present in especially high concentration, again okay, especially high concentration in the young leaf, stem, and also the seeds. Okay. So seeds involved in the seed germination. And stem involved in the stem elongation. Okay. Okay. Uh. So gibberellin are involved in the control of germination of the seed, for example, in the wheat and also the barley. So let us look at this, uh, the structure of the seed. So few structure that we need to know. First, endosperm, we have learned about this. So endosperm actually have the starch storage. Okay, 
And then second part is the aileron layer. Aileron layer contains the, the, the amino acid. Okay, and also vitamins. Okay, yeah. and then we do have this, okay, embryo. Embryo is the one that we later will grow into a plant. So these three parts that we need to know, okay? The hash basically is a seed coat. Right? Most of the seed going to protect, right? Then the seeds, then they have this hash. Right? This hash actually is also termed as seed coat, okay? It's the barley seed here. Okay, uh? so what actually happened here, we do know that the seed contains the embryo, which will grow and form a new plant when the seed germinates. And this embryo is surrounded by the endosperm, which is energy storage, containing the polysaccharide and the starch. And on the outer edge of the endosperm is a protein-rich aileron layer where we can get the amino acid and to build the proteins. And we do have the seed coats, okay, which is waterproof and protects the seed. Okay. Now, what actually happened here is when gibberellin and the seed germination, how this thing actually take place? First, we, um, we do know that seed won't simply germinate. Okay. And they want to germinate means that the conditions allow them to germinate. So what is the main condition? They must have sufficient water so, I mean, uh, supply, right? So first thing, the water absorbed by the embryo. So it means that if the surrounding is moist enough, have, having sufficient uh, the, the water and supplies, then water will be uh, absorbed by the embryo. So what embryo do? So embryo will respond by releasing the gibberellin. Are you clear? So gibberellin will diffuse okay, into the aileron layer. In the aileron layer, then transcription process takes place. So this is the part where gibberellin bind to the receptor. Okay. So what, uh, what are the things that didn't show it here is, first, this gibberellin, GA, will bind to the receptor. So what they do, they form the gibberellin receptor complex. So what this complex can do, this complex will trigger a series of reactions and result in the okay, hydrolysis or broken downs of what we call it as the Della protein. Can I still remember the Della protein? And because of the hydrolysis of DELA protein or breakdown of DELA proteins, therefore we free the transcription factor, which is the phytochrome interacting okay, factor, PIF. And this transcription factor now can bind to the promoter, allowing the gene activation or expression. So what are the genes here? So the gene that involves okay, in the coding of the amylase. Are you clear? So in this case, this part, what we didn't see here, basically the gibberellin will bind to the receptor forming the gibberellin acid receptor complex. This complex will trigger a series of reaction and result in the hydrolysis of the DELA protein. And DELA protein, when they hydrolyze already or break down uh, DELA protein, we're going to free the transcription factor, which is a PIF, the phytochromes interacting factor. So allowing this uh, transcription factor to bind to the promoter and mRNA will be synthesized because of the RNA polymerase can bind the promoter and we have a gene expression. For example, in this case, we can see that we have the gene expression for amylase. Therefore, we code for the amylase. So why aileron layer? Aileron layer because they are rich in protein. So rich in amino acid. So this amino acid can be used, okay, to synthesize the amylase. Are you clear? So this amylase, Okay, when you have this amylase already, this amylase will cause the hydrolysis of the starch amylose and amylopeptin result in the formation of the maltose. Maltose will be broken down by maltase to form the glucose. So therefore, glucose will be used as the respiratory substrate for the embryo to germinate. Okay, All right, because of the uh, oxidations of the glucose provides the ATP, okay? So this is the answer, okay? So when the seed is shaped from the plant, parent plant, it is a state of dormancy. As I say that, it contains very little water and is metabolically inactive. 
This is useful because it allows the seed to survive in the adverse condition, such as uh, a cold winter, only germinates when the temperature rises in spring and sufficient water. So that's why we do have a seed bank. We can actually store the seed. Okay. So first, we say that the absorption of the water molecule at the beginning of germination stimulates the embryo to produce the gibberine. Are you clear? So this gibberine, okay, diffuses to the iron layer and stimulates the cells to synthesize the amylase. So what actually happened? It binds to the receptor and causes the, break, the, uh, break, uh, the breakdowns of the DELA protein and therefore allow the PIF, okay, phytochrome interacting proteins or factor to bind to the target's promoter. So transcription of the genes can take place now, resulting in an increase in the amylase production. So amylase mobilize the energy storage by hydrolyzing the starch molecule in the endosperm, converting them into the soluble maltose molecule, and maltose will be converted to the glucose and transport to the embryo, providing a source of the carbohydrates that can be respired, okay, or means can be oxidized to provide energy as the embryo begin to grow, eh? because if you want to grow, so few anabolic reactions take place, right? Because we need to carry eh, for the mitosis and cell divisions. So means that we do need the anabolic reaction. So all anabolic reaction require ATP. Are you clear? Because of mitosis, eh? And because before mitosis, we have the protein synthesis, right? And we also have the mRNA synthesis. We do have the DNA synthesis. All these anabolic reactions require ATP. So who supply the ATP? The oxidations of the glucose. So where this glucose take, uh, 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 coming from? So this glucose actually because of the hydrolysis of the starch eh, due to the presence of the amylase. Okay, are you guys clear about this? Gibberellin not only uh, involved in the seed germinations, but also the stem elongations. Okay, and this uh, is controlled partly because of the gene, eh, the height of the, some plants, for example, the, the how high the plant, the tonus of the pea plant is affected by a gene with two alleles, eh, the dominant allele small le, and also the recessive allele, uh, sorry, uh, dominant allele big le, and a small, uh, uh, the recessive allele small le here. Okay, so the plant with the dominant allele, at least one copy, the plants can grow tall, but the homozygous with the recessive le will remain short. Okay. So this dominant allele of this gene regulates the synthesis of the last enzyme in the pathway that produces active form of gibberellin. So it means that the gibberellin, GA, so this one's inactive. If we want to make them become active, then we need to have the enzyme. So this enzyme actually coded by the gene with two allele. One is big LE allele, Another one is a small LE allele. So big LE allele will, right, will code for the enzyme. Small LE allele, no enzyme. Are you clear? So if no enzyme means that the plants will be, right, we won't have this gibberellate acid, the active form. If no active form, therefore the, uh, the, uh, the plant become dwarf. So basically they won't grow tall, okay? But, if you look at this active gibberellin, active gibberellin actually stimulates the cell divisions and the stem elongation. So cause the plant to grow tall. Okay, so a substitution mutation in this gene gives rise to the change from alanine to threonine in the primary structure enzyme near to its active site, producing a non-functional enzyme. So this mutation gives rise to the recessive allele small le. So homozygous plants small le, small le are genetically dwarf as they do not have the active form of the gibberellin. So, but they don't have the uh, active form gibberellin, but they still have the, okay? They still have this, what we call the, the gibberellin receptor, right? So therefore, if we apply active gibberellin to the plant, that would normally remain short, like our well, cabbage, you can stimulate them to grow tall because they still have the receptor, unless they don't have receptor. If they don't have the gibberellin receptor, then no choice. They won't be able to actually grow 
top. Are you clear? Okay. Huh? So with this, I have done for the entire A2 syllabus.